Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I can tell it's a work night. <laughs> oh, glory to Jesus. It is time. Pardon? <laughs> Let's stand and pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father. Oh, what a sweet presence in this place, God. I thank you for all those that gathered this morning and sought your face, sought your heart, so that you would have your way. We so desire you, God. Grateful for this week of gathering every night to worship and to get the word, to be transformed, God. Please come in like a flood. Even if we fight you, please come in like a flood. We need you more than we know. Oh, Father, have your way, have your way, have your way, and let us bring you glory. Let us bring you pleasure. Enjoy hanging out with us tonight, God, because the love in this place is all for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Thank you, God. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. You ready to go over there, Mr. Phil? Okay. As we lift up your name, as we lift up your name, let your fire fall, let your fire fall, send your wind and your rain, send your wind and your rain, on your wings of love, on your wings of love, pour out from heaven your passion and presence, bring down your burning desire, revival. With hearts ablaze for Jesus, Father, let revival fire fall. Yes, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. As we lift up your name, as we lift up your name, let your fire fall. Let your fire fall. Send your wind and your rain. Send your wind and your rain. On your wings of love. On your wings of love. Pour out from heaven your passion and presence. Bring down your burning desire. Revival fire fall. <clears throat> Revival fire fall. Fall on us here in the power of your spirit. Father, let revival fire fall. With hearts ablaze for Jesus, Father, let revival fire fall. Yes, God. Yes, God. Holy Spirit, let your glory fall in the house. When your heart beats, when your heart beats, I want to feel it. I want to feel it. When your voice speaks, when your voice speaks, I want to hear it. I want to hear it. When your eyes cry, when your eyes cry, I want to catch the tears. I want to catch the tears. I want to know you.
want to answer you. I want to answer you. I want to know you. Oh, my Lord, I want to know you. to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. High and lift it up. High and lift it up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. I want to see you more and more and more and more, God. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Yes, God. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. High and lift it up. High and lift it up. Shining in the light of your glory. 
pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see. Be 
and nothing I desire compares with you. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I sing praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praises to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. And I give glory to your name. I give glory to your name. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, Lord, glory to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. I give glory to your name. Oh, Lord, glory to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised yes yes jesus for your name is great and greatly to be praised for your name is great god and greatly to be you Jesus bless you father hallelujah 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 glory 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 to your name glory 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 to the name of Jesus hallelujah thank you thank you thank you worthy 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 are you worthy 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 of you my God and my King my Savior, my Redeemer, we love you, we praise you. We love you, we praise you, we love you, we praise you, Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah God. Hallelujah, Jesus, 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 Jesus. This is holy ground. We're standing on holy ground. For the Lord is present, and where he is, is 
Exalt you, King Jesus. We worship you. Give you the highest praise. The highest praise. I worship you, Almighty. 
mighty God, there is none like you. I worship you, almighty God, there is none like you. Hallelujah. I worship you, O Prince of Peace, that is what I long to do, I give you praise, for you are my righteousness, yes, Jesus, I worship you. sing that again. I worship you, almighty God. I, I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. My Jesus, my Jesus. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I long clap offering tonight. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Hallelujah. 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 Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, praise his name. All that is within me, worship him. Thank you, Father God. Glory, 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 glory. Oh, be blessed, Father. Be blessed, Father. Receive our praise. Receive our worship. God, fill this sanctuary with more of you. Overcome our tiredness, overcome our sickness. God, overcome anything that needs to be overcome tonight that you would have our full attention, God, that you would have all of our heart this time tonight, Lord. God, it's a serious time and it's serious business when we come into the presence of God. We thank you. I, for one, am so grateful for what you're doing here. I thank you for Pastor. I call him Pastor because he is, in a sense, my Pastor Glenn and Jesse, Lord, for their obedience, for their anointing, for their sacrifice, for their giving, for their coming and for their doing and for them speaking only what needs to be spoken to us. And God, tonight again, let us receive it. Let us receive it. Lord, let us not pick and choose from the banqueting table, but take what you've, you've served us tonight in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Okay. You all right? Do you need prayer? You sure? Okay. All right. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I think we got a fresh, special song before we invite our evangelists up here. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hello, everybody. Hmm? You're not singing? Um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me go get my Bible. <laughs>
I heard once a bird has a broken wing. He can never fly high anymore. Let me tell you. Like a vulture, he swept low, and in my darkest hour, that's when the enemy came to try to devour what was left of my wretched, my dying soul. songs about all of you tonight, flying higher than you ever flown before, amen. That's what our God does when we let him clip those funny little things down here that keep us on the ground. Amen. We go up. Hallelujah. Man, what is... <laughs> yeah, no more gravity one day. No more gravity one day. Thank you, Father God. Bless the Lord. Well, good to see everybody again tonight, and rather than pass the plate for the offering this evening... 
There's an offering box that back there. If you want to give your tithes and gifts to the church, feel free. If you have a special offering for our, our wonderful evangelists, then just write in the bottom, wonderful evangelists. <laughs> and I'll give it to me. No, I mean, <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. But Glenn, would you come? I so appreciate Glenn and Jesse. We've been having a wonderful time. Yes. Praise the Lord. Here you go, brother. Thank you. Well, that was a good song by Philip. Yeah. Now, you didn't write that, did you? No? Okay. All right. Well, he has that southern sound without the twang. It's in the genes, huh? Well, I have to make a, a, a confession, though. Yeah. Um, it was good, really good. I enjoyed it. It was great, but I'm not a fan of country gospel. I mean, no, never. Yeah, yeah, never. Yeah. But, you know, the, the Lord has a sense of humor, so um, not that country gospel's in heaven, but um, uh, okay. <laughs> and... Uh, Anyway, we pull up at this church in Maine, first time I'm there, and uh, the pastor comes out to meet us and, you know, show us where to park, and then he just happens to say, um, I hope you don't mind, but there's a, a friend of ours that he comes out every year, and he's a, a, a singing evangelist, a country music recording art, artist, and so he didn't have anywhere to minister this weekend, so I asked him to come, and I'm going, oh, no, God, oh. You know, I'm trying to be happy. Oh, yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, the, Rocky Morris, I mean, he's a sweetheart of a guy. He was. He's with Jesus now. But, um, you know, it became a tradition. Every year I was there, Rocky was there. <laughs> I mean, it was like, oh, no, he wasn't. You know, he was helping me to endure. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, I mean, we enjoyed the time together. I can't ever say, I'm just going to be honest here, I can't ever say I felt the presence of God move in the services because he did the worship and then, you know, I did the preaching. But it's so strange how you get, get now he didn't do it, but we've been in southern churches, you know, and, and how they can take songs, contemporary songs, and turn them into country. I don't know how they do that, you know. It's just, it doesn't sound like that. The original doesn't sound like that at all when you do it. But they can't get it out of them. They got that style, and uh, yeah, it's good. It's fun. Thank you, Jesus. All right, I won't pick on country music anymore. <laughs> well, Father, we come before you now in the precious name of Jesus, and we just thank you for your love and mercy that endures forever, and we ask that you would teach us this evening the truths we're going to look at, and Lord, we want the grace to live this out in Jesus' name. Well, I will give another story. We were uh, starting out as evangelists, so we're in the Florida area in Pensacola during the Brownsville Revival. That was our home church for four years, and um, we end up speaking at this one church outside of Pensacola. I'll tell you what, man, it was, I think, maybe the most southern church I've ever been into. I mean, it was like super duper duper deep south. And so, you know, they even, the, the hymn books that they had there, I never even heard them, Tennessee hymns. I'm going, I never heard this. Like, you open it off, and they're good. They, there's hymns you never even heard the names of, you know. So anyway, the service goes to start. You know, a woman's at the, at the piano, and she's playing that very southern style, and, you know, singing, kind of warming things up. And then when it's time, the other musicians start coming up, and here's this man probably in his 80s, you know, and he's just moseys up there and, you know, steps up and goes to, they had some pews around the side of the, of the platform. He goes under there, and he reaches under, and he pulls out this big old wash pan and a stick, and he sits there, and he's boom, 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 boom. And it's just, they do the whole thing with his wash. So, yeah, so that was like about the deepest south I've been in. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, this evening I want to look at pleasing God. And of course, at the top of the list is not Kung Fu, so. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> oh, you don't even know what it is. That's all right. <laughs> pleasing God. And, uh, you know, we have, a, we have to come to the place where we really have a desire to please God. So let's just pretend I have a friend, and this friend, uh, or at least he claims to be a friend, and every time he sees me, instead of calling me Glenn, he calls me George. You know, and so I go up to him, I says, every time he does it, my name's not George, it's Glenn. He says, no, no, I know it's George, and that's fine, I'll call you by George, that's not a problem, you know, I don't mind it. You know, he just won't listen to me. I just try and tell him I'm Glenn, I'm not George. And, you know, so then he says, I got a present for you. And he, you know, gives me this present and I unwrap it. And, and here's this green, ugly Packers fan tie, you know. And I'm going, I'm not a Packers fan. Oh, yes, you are. I know you are. He says, I don't even like football. I don't watch football. Oh, you love the Packers. I know they're your favorite. And going, oh. He says, besides, why don't you come over? For dinner tonight, man, I got your favorite. I made your favorite on purpose. Liver and onions and Brussels sprouts and asparagus. And, you know, I might even throw in a little bit of tofu for you. And just going, I hate that food. Don't you dare give that to me. I will not eat it. You know, I mean, the guy claims to know me, but he doesn't know me. And, you see, if we want to be pleasing to God, we've got to know him. If we don't know him... We can never please him. But if we do know him, or at least about him, and we don't please him, now it's just sheer rebellion. And I think that can both be in the church there, that you have those that they are ignorant of who God is, and they're not willing to search it out and to understand who this God is and how to please him. And then you have others that, well, they know what pleases God, but they refuse to do it. They refuse to do it. But then they still try to lie to themselves and say, well, I'm saved by grace, so everything's okay. Well, there's only one way to please God, and that's the way that God says. And he has given it to us clear enough in Scripture that we can understand this truth so that we can put it into practice. So he hasn't left us to time and chance. He has given us enough in the Word of God that we can know how to please him and live a life that brings him joy. Now, if I were to go around and take a little poll of each of you privately and ask you whether you thought you pleased God or not, I think I'd have some diverse answers. Some of you would say yes, some of you would say no, some of you would say I, would, I don't know. But yet a lot of Christians really struggle with the aspect of whether or not they're pleasing to God. Because there's times that we can feel we aren't. Sometimes legitimate, because we got something in our life that's displeasing to him. Other times, we've let the devil do a little beating on us and not come to the place to understand that we can really be pleasing to God. So we can make him out to be a big ogre, a God that is unable to be pleased. And so we have this high calling. And if I might put it like this, our, our high calling is to glorify God in everything we say and do and enjoy him forevermore. And if we might whittle that down, it is just really simple. We are called to live a life that pleases him. So that's our calling. If you were to look at what is the purpose of your life, it's not about the job you work. It's not about the education you get or anything else. It's about living a life that pleases him. So we have things in the word of God that plain and simple tell us how to please him. Things we shouldn't do and things we should do. Those are able to be done through the grace of God. But then we have some, some dimensions of this that now has to get very personal, okay? So the Lord told us to go and, and preach the gospel to all the world. What does that mean for me personally? Where am I to do it? Where's the world he wants me to go into and preach? And so, you know, then we have to say, how is this to be applied to me personally? But obedience to that is not an option. If we're going to please God, then we have to do it. We have to live those things out and then see how they're to be applied to our life. There are no excuses. God will not accept those excuses. When we stand before him, we can go and say, well, I wasn't pleasing you in this area of my life because of this or because of that or because of this person or that person. God will not accept blame shifting. He will not accept blame shifting. If we're going to be pleasing to him, we have to learn his ways and then cry out for the grace to live it out. So here's a very interesting verse about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 1. We're going to go through a lot of different scriptures, so you can run along with me if you want or just listen. But it says, finally, brothers, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. 
Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. What an interesting thought that's there. So he says, we've instructed you how to please God. Okay, we taught you how. But now we want you to do this more and more. So what that really teaches us is that we can come to the place to please God, but when we come to the place to please God, if we stay in that place, we're not going to please him anymore. Because we have to continue maturing in this faith. We have to continue going on. So we have to go deeper and deeper into Christ as we're walking this, this life out so that we are pleasing to him in all things. And so this is a continual place of growing. There's no place where we graduate until we breathe our last. When we breathe our last, then we graduate. Then we go home to be with Jesus, and then we're never going to have to deal with our sinful nature again. Until that time, we are to grow in pleasing God. And so this is really a, a, a simple thing. It's a, a, a simple thought here. But there is a difference between a 2-year-old and a 20-year-old, or at least there should be. So what a parent expects of a 2-year-old, he shouldn't expect, the parent shouldn't expect of a 20-year-old. They're two different things, and to demand of a 2-year-old what you expect of a 20-year-old would be abusive. So you ask the 2-year-old to go and, and clean up his room, and he picks up a few blocks and puts it in the toy box, and next thing you know, he's distracted, and he's off in some other place. You know, I mean, his attention span is 15 seconds at the most. You know, and so if he does a little bit, Mama can go and say, oh, well, that's good, son. Why don't you do a little bit more, and you kind of move him along. But if you go to your 20-year-old and you say, I want you to clean your room, it's a mess, and he does that, well, you need to have a serious talking with him then. You know, because there's something wrong with the 20-year-old. He goes and he picks up two things, and he's off in some other place. You see, a 20-year-old, you expect to live like a 20-year-old. A 2-year-old, like a 2-year-old. God expects of us where we are in our spiritual maturity. But just like maturity goes on in the natural realm, maturity in the spiritual realm is a choice of the will, but that should be going on as well. So we should no longer be infants tossed to and fro, we should now start becoming mature and learning how to become teachers of the word and giving the word of way rather than always having to be bottle fed. And so to be pleasing, there must be this maturing process. And central to this is, is the understanding we need that God can be pleased. He can be pleased. And I'll just be honest with you about this. That uh, boggles my mind. I mean, he can be pleased. I just, I really don't understand how that works. But it is because he does not expect of us what he expects of angels. You understand there's a whole different thing there. He understands our frailty. He understands the fall we live under. And he never justifies it. But he understands there's something that's different there. And he's calling us to a place to grow and mature in him. And to please him never happens by time and chance. It isn't by accident. It is purposely desired, purposely pursued, purposely lived out. And so when you look at, at the idea of God, is he has perfect everything, all right? Infinite everything about him. He is infinite in every dimension of his being. So that means that God has perfect emotions, infinite emotions. And since we are created in God's image, at least to a limited degree, we have emotions that that represent or mirror God. And so the emotions we have that are twisted, okay, we have these emotions and they get all out of whack, but God has in perfection, in, in absolute beauty and depth beyond anything we can imagine. So when God has joy, God knows joy deeper than we've ever known and deeper than we've ever un ever understood when he loves his love is this infinite love and i know people try to say that that god is unconditional love the problem is i don't see that in the bible i just don't see it there i see god loves with an agape love but i also see where god says that he hates the wicked man so you know this whole idea of unconditional love it doesn't have a biblical foundation though it's really popular to preach super popular to preach and it's all kinds of songs and movies and stuff like that but they don't take the time to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says on this subject. But God has these perfect emotions. So that means that he has sorrow like we can't even fathom. I mean, do you understand? 
His emotions are perfect. There's no sin in them. The sorrow he has is not evil, is not from a fallen nature, is not from bad things we have done, it, from what he has done. It is what we have done that we grieve him. And the grief in God can be so deep and the sorrow for what we have done can be beyond anything we can imagine. God feels. And to understand those emotions is near impossible for us because our emotions are not where they should be. One day they'll be perfected in heaven. I mean, we will have perfect emotions and they will function the way they were created to function. They will be beautiful. And I believe some of those emotions will be done away with because there will be no need, at least as I am trying to understand it now, no need for sorrow there because he will take away every tear. But have we ever really thought about how our sin and disobedience breaks the heart of God, grieves him? It really does. But because we don't understand this dimension of God, we try and make this an impersonal thing, and what I do really doesn't hurt him. Well, we can cause him deeper grief than we have ever understood. And so we need to become a people that really want to please him. So you have examples, tons of examples in Scripture and tons of examples in church history of people that have pleased God. But let's look just at a, uh, for a few minutes at some of the examples in Scripture. I think one of the first examples in Scripture of pleasing God is Enoch. And uh, I'm going to go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5, just to speak on him. But Enoch, it says, By faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Now, some translations will, will translate taken as translated or something like that. Because, you know, the, the word really is a simple word. It's a basic word. It means take, taken, something along that line. So here you have the situation where God took him. He took him out of this world. Why did he take him out of this world? Because this man had come to a place in his life that all he sought to do was please God. He brought such joy to the heart of God that God finally says, son, it's time to come home. I want you home with me. And bap, zam, he's gone. Right? In a moment. And I have to imagine it didn't happen while he was going for a walk in the woods. Because nobody would have known what happened to him. I think it happened smack dab in the middle of a family reunion or something. You know, all the families around, all these people are there. All of a sudden, there's, there's uh, Grandpa Enoch or Daddy Enoch or whatever, and just gone. It's just their mouths gaping open. What happened to them? Gone. Because he had the testimony of a man that pleased God. And so God can be pleased. There's evidence of a man that did it. Then you have in the book of Job, you have in verse 1 of chapter 1, in the land of Uts, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And so here's a man that, according to what God says in this testimony and what goes on in the book of Job, that there was no other like him in the earth. No other like him. There's a man that, that had this impeccable character that he strove to please God. That was the aim of his life. And even when you look at it, he is trying to do, do sacrifice for the sins of his children in case they grieve God. So you have this man that the desire of his heart was to bring joy to God. And he looked at any way that he could to bring joy to him. And that means we stop doing what displeases him and we do what pleases him. Now, he didn't have the benefit of the Bible did he? Neither did Enoch. They didn't have the Old Testament scriptures even to go to. They didn't have the ability to say, what does the book of such and such say? He couldn't read it. He couldn't study it. But yet they both had a relationship with God. And from that relationship, they had a conscience that God dealt with their conscience and helped them to understand what was right and wrong, what was right sacrifice and wrong sacrifice, how to do what was pleasing to God. And I would venture to say we know how to please God more than sometimes we really want to admit. Because if we admit it, then we have to admit how much we have brought displeasure and heartache to God. We should understand that when we sin, we break the heart of God. We should. We need that. So we don't diminish and make small the reality of sin. But we need to also understand that this God can be pleased. 
in a different direction with this as you go to the Old Testament and you have the children of Israel delivered from Egypt and now they're around the Mount of God and it was around the Mount of God that God starts revealing to Moses uh, the whole sacrificial system, the whole thing that we call the Mosaic Law and it's all being written down and in this he has given Moses explicit instructions on how to build a portable church called the Tabernacle. So it was a portable church made of tents and, and it had a, a holy place, a most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant would be put and the Ark of the Covenant was, was given to Moses exactly what it should be. The Ark should be, be this box that had poles in it overlaid with gold inside and outside where the Ten Commandments and anything else God said was to be put on it. And then on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. The mercy seat was separate from the Ark of the Covenant. And on that were two cherubims that made, in essence, a throne. And when this was put in the Holy of Holies, that's where God would, would, in essence, sit as a representative of his presence of the Holy Spirit to lead the people. It tells us that when Moses put together the, the tabernacle for the first time, set up all the, the, the altars and, and all that was involved in that, had instructed Aaron and his sons on how to do the sacrifices, and they prepared the very first sacrifice on the altar of sacrifice. Everything was done exactly according to God's will in perfect obedience. It says that when he did this, that fire came out of heaven and consumed the sacrifice and set the fire on the altar. Now, I think that's very interesting because from that time on, Israel was to protect that fire and never let that fire go out. Even when they traveled, they had to keep that fire burning because that was a holy fire started by God. And when God slew Aaron's two sons because of strange fire, they didn't take fire that had been started by God. They took it fire that they started from their whatever, their big click. And so God consumed that offering saying, I am pleased with Moses. I am pleased with Aaron. I'm pleased with what they did. Isn't that interesting? The same identical thing happens when he goes and, and builds the, uh, when Solomon builds the, uh, the temple. Same identical thing. At the end of it, when it's all built and the first sacrifice, there's the offering on it and fire comes down and consumes the, the sacrifice, sets the altar ablaze, and guess what? All the people fell down and said, the Lord, he is God, and began to worship him. So what God said is, I am pleased with what King David set in motion and now his son Solomon has finished. And when you look at what King David did, he went through extensive preparations, I mean extensive preparations, in all that he gathered of gold and brass and, and, the, and the spoils of war he didn't keep for himself. He went and kept giving to the temple so that they would have all this money to be able to build and pay the workers and this great temple to be built for God. And so he was pleased with it. Then you have in a different situation in the New Testament, you have a man called Stephen. He's one of the first deacons, first seven deacons. That's there. He was not an apostle, but I believe he was probably early in the ministry there uh, with Jesus. And so he had seen miracles, heard Jesus preach and teach and, and so on. And, and so here's this man that has a testimony from God that he is full of faith, full of the Holy Ghost, full of wisdom, full of grace and full of power. Five things in, in those two chapters, Acts chapter 6 and 7, that God says this is the man that has these five things. And I'll tell you what, if we had those five things really in operation to be full of them, we would be pleasing to God and we would be doing a tremendous work for God. Now Stephen comes to the place and he's beginning to preach. And he's having a crowd that is very hostile to him. And as they grow hostile, the anointing sets heavier upon him, convicting the people that he's speaking to of their sin. The conviction is so great that there was a point where they stuck their fingers in their ears and began to gnash at him with their feet, teeth. That doesn't mean they started biting him, but gritting their teeth. And, and that's an expression of anger and hatred and rage. They rush upon him and take him out and stone him to death. This is what Stephen said. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He's seeing this phenomenal vision 
And why was Jesus standing and not sitting? He was waiting for the very first martyr of the church to come home. Stephen was pleasing. You know, the devil wanted to silence the man, wanted to silence him. Hell hated the man. And yet even in the aspect of him being martyred for the cause of Christ, he was pleasing to God because it wasn't just that he was the first martyr, it's that he died trying to be like Jesus in it because he even goes and says what Jesus said from the, from the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So this man was striving with all that was in him to be pleasing to God. And God would be absolutely cruel if he told us, commanded us to please him, but did not make it possible to do so. So God has not only commanded us to do what pleases him, but he offers us all the grace to please him so that we are without excuse. That if we do not live a life that pleases him, there's nobody to blame other than ourselves that we chose not to live it out. When you come to Revelation chapter 2 and 3, I know we're very familiar with it. You have uh, John being the secretary of Jesus and taking down the dictation Jesus giving for seven letters. And each letter was to go to a different church. So seven letters to seven different churches. Would you like to get a letter from Jesus? I don't think I would. I'm just being honest. You know, I mean, if we'd all want to go and say, he was going to say wonderful things to me, he might a little bit. <laughs> you know, but what about the other stuff that he's going to say? And to some, he might not have anything good to say, such as the Laodicea. He had nothing good to say. The letter there was just, just this, this rebuke from beginning to end. That'd be a terrible letter to get. Love, still it was love. You understand? That was the love of God being offered to the Laodiceans so that they might repent because they were not living to please God. They were living to please self. That's all it was. They were living for self-gratification, for their own desires, for their own wants, for their own purposes, not for the will of God not to bring joy to the heart of God. And so of those seven churches, there's five he rebuked to that he praised, or the five he rebuked for are praised a little bit. And, you know, you start reading that letter, so you get this letter from Jesus, and, you know, right there at the beginning, says, oh, child, you're doing a good job in this and that. I really appreciate that. And then you come to the next paragraph, and you stop dead short. Just can't go anymore because it says... I hold this against you. That's what he did. He went to some of those churches, I hold this against you. Said the things that they were doing. Okay, that's good, you're doing that. That's all right, but I hold this against you. And if you don't repent, I'm going to take away your candlestick. That means I'm going to take away your salvation. If you don't repent, okay, you're doing some good stuff, get this right, or you are outside of my salvation, outside of my kingdom. To Smyrna, it's so interesting. He went to Smyrna... And he says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are wit rich. He said to Smyrna the exact opposite of what he said to Laodicea, because he said to Laodicea, you say I'm rich and I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Here was Smyrna pleasing God, yet they were in poverty and need and being persecuted. And what would, I, what would the church today, what would so much of the church today say if you had this little poor church with all these poor people and, and they're struggling just with the whole thing and, and what would the whole church growth movement say? You are a failure. And what would Jesus say to the whole church growth movement? You are a bunch of hypocrites. You're like Laodicea. I'm pleased with them because everything in them is striving to follow me. They may not have much, but they have wealth in me. And you have all this prosperity and all this stuff, and you don't realize how far away from me you really are. Two churches he praised, and really only one of them he fully praised, which was Smyrna. Another one he praised, and there's this subtle correction in it. I wouldn't call it reproof, but it's subtle, and it's the Philadelphia. And he says, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door, and no one can shut it. I know you have little strength. There's a slight rebuke. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. See, with the little strength they had, they strove to be faithful. They strove to please God. 
But I think God was trying to tell them, you have little strength. Get stronger. Because things are going to get harder. You see, God loved these churches, loved the people in the churches, loved the pastors of these churches. But those that he rebuked were rebuked because they didn't love God supremely and they didn't fear him and were not striving to please him. Isn't that so strange that what's church all about? Is it just trying to come and sing some songs and do a few good deeds and everything's okay? Or is it all about learning how to please God? And part of the pleasing of God, of course, is worship. All right, worship, God doesn't need worship. It's not about him. Worship is about us entering into fellowship with him. It brings us to a place of different fellowship with him than what we have in our private prayer closet. It's a different thing. It's the community of saints coming together and as a body to be pleased to him, offering up these praises that allows us to enter into fellowship with him. And when he's pleased, you know what happens? That's when you feel his presence come down. That's when you feel his, feel his nearness. I'm pleased with what's going on. I'm pleased with my children coming together, loving me. And so I'm going to let you know that I love you by my presence coming by you being able to experience my nearness. And he wants that more. Not that we are to live by experience, but it is wonderful to experience God. And God wants his presence to be known and understood because it's, he wants us to walk in that place of saying, I know that right now I'm in the place of pleasing God. And when I please God, it is such a joy. There's such peace. There's such, such, such life that comes out of it. God, I want to do this more and more. Because when we, begin, when we begin to understand it, we know when we don't please God and that displeasure is experienced. We know it. We know it. There's something there. We just know that there's some separation. We harden our heart to it. We get further and further away until eventually we get a letter from them like this. And I hold this against you. So I want to look at a few things that God is pleased in. There's many things. We could go and spend days and days on what is God pleased with, but I'm just going to touch on a few points here. And I know that you know other things, but these are some that we need to really concentrate on because, like I said, the churches that were rebuked, the five churches that were rebuked were rebuked because they did not fear God. And that's the first thing I want to look at. We please God through the fear of God, through fearing Him. Now, when God went and to the children of Israel when they were around the Mount of God. And he told them, says, consecrate yourself. Get ready. In three days, I'm going to come down on the mountain. All right, so they were to, to get ready. They were to purify their lives, you know, get the sin out, you know, come to a place that they're as holy as they can be in and, and thought, word, and deed uh, between each other and between God. And, and so everything's ready, and God's going to come down on the mountain. And so the day happens these trumpets blare. It was not Israel, any trumpets of heaven, uh, of earth. It was trumpets of heaven. And they hear the trumpets, and all of a sudden, God steps down on top of the mountain, and the mountain is ablaze with fire. It had to be a terrifying thing. It had to also be something that you'd feel, that you'd literally feel the rumbling and the reality of God being on that mountain. He wanted the effect upon them. What were they supposed to do when God came on the mountain? They were to go up the mountain into that fire, and be in the presence of God. Three million people were to go up that mountain. You understand? That was obedience. They all rebelled. They all rebelled. So what did Moses do? He went to him and rebuked him. He says, do not be afraid of God, but fear him so that you do not sin. Big difference between being afraid of God and fearing him. Now, those who are not Christians, aren't walking with God, they should be afraid of him. They should be afraid because they are going to face his wrath. They will face the reality of a God that is displeased with them because they've lived a life of rebellion. But for those who belong to Jesus, truly belong to him, they should fear him. Now, fear has three expressions. The first one is reverence. And if you talk to people about the fear of God, this is where they always go. They usually always think of it as reverence. The problem is, is that's not the majority of what the fear of God is. You only have a, a couple of verses in the Bible that refer to the fear of God in that particular way. One particular one is in Malachi chapter 1, verse 6, where it says, A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? Well, if you really go and you strive to understand what this says, uh, you're going to see something very, very radical here. Because he's saying, okay, 
if I'm your father, where's the respect as a son? And we can't put it in American culture where boys and girls are rebels against their parents so often. We have to go back in an ancient culture. We have to go back to a place where they went and said, if, you're, if your son or your daughter is in rebellion against you, take him outside the community of Israel and stone him to death. It was not tolerated. Your father went and told you what to do, and you did it. If you were a son, your inheritance, your ability to survive after your father died depended on your obedience to him because if he cut you off from the inheritance, you had nothing. You had absolutely nothing. Obedience to the father was absolute. He says, you call me your father, but where's the obedience? Do me. He says, you call me master, but you don't treat me like a master. And, and if you want to think of it, there was to be the love relation between a father and the children. Their obedience should have been to the father out of love and respect. But to a master, it was to be absolute. If the master says, you do this, you do that. And if you didn't obey the master, what would take place in that culture would, could be very severe. He says, okay, you call, me, you call me master, but you refuse to obey me. And so if we want to see what it is to please God, isn't it something right here that it begins, that we begin to honor him as a father in obedience? When he says, son, stop that, we stop it. When he says, son, do this, we do that. And shouldn't it be then as a, as a servant to a master that whatever he commands, there's no question. There's no question. We obey. And we can obey in that way if we wanted to because we know that God is good and God only does good and he's not going to command me to do anything that's contrary to him or anything that is evil. He will only command me to do what is good and right for the glory of God and for my own life and for the lives of others. Every time he will say only what is good. Now, the second way that fear is understood is the big way in the Bible, okay? This is the biggest way. When you see the fear of God, you know, probably 99% of it almost is, is in this way, and it means to tremble. It means to tremble. And, I mean, when Jesus walked this planet, nobody understood who he was. Nobody. When that little baby was in a manger, Mary and Joseph did not comprehend who was in that manger. You understand? They didn't comprehend. They couldn't comprehend because that little baby spoke heaven and earth into existence with a word. That little baby, we're told in Psalms, breathed stars out of his mouth. That little baby was the most dangerous person the world has ever known. And the most, pu most pure and holy. You understand? People don't understand who this Jesus is. And when you've got a God that is of infinite power, that knows us perfectly, I mean, knows us, everything about us, things we don't even understand about ourselves, he knows. If there's this God that knows us so completely and has absolutely, absolute power and has the ability to cast me into hell or to let me into heaven, then I should know how to wisely and correctly tremble before him. Now, let me go to the next and the third point. And this is the one where I really want to get to. And it's not directly there, but it's directly with what I'm talking about. The fear of God is with those who love him and are longing for his approval. The love of an adoring son or daughter. Do you know, when we have that kind of love, then we fear hurting him. We fear breaking his heart. It's not the fear that he's going to have a bolt of lightning come down and zap me and I'm out of this world, okay? I'm cast immediately into hell. It is the fear of an adoring child of breaking the heart of God. That we have this longing inside of us, we tremble before him because we want to bring joy to his heart, Yet he's not this God that has made it impossible to know how to do this. He's made it available. He's made it possible. We can please God if we want to. If we want to. And so when you had the slaying of Ananias and Sapphira because they lied to the Holy Spirit, this was in the book of Acts and would be in Acts chapter 5, it says this great fear fell upon the people. But this wasn't necessarily the fear 
out of love. This was to tremble before a God of power. We can't forget who he is. Now, just imagine this. And I know I've probably given this illustration before, but I think it's just so, so beautiful in explaining this, is when we become a true follower of Jesus, we become a child of his. I mean, we are truly saved. We truly belong to him. We are now adopted children. And so as an adopted child, here I can sit in the, in, in the house of the king and I can sit on the floor and play with the king. I can, I can go and, and, and do games and play with him and put my head upon his bosom and hug him and be hugged by him. I mean, I can enjoy him as father. I can know the joy of that place as a son or as a daughter. I can know that joy. But the moment he stands up and he walks over to this place where he keeps his, his royal apparel, he grabs hold of his robe and puts it on. Everything starts changing with the son. He doesn't stop being a son, but he changes because now the father puts on the crown. He grabs hold of the scepter. Now he's having to deal with king. And when that king steps in that throne room, that boy better understand that if that king is a righteous king, if that boy commits the same crimes that people do out there and judge of that king, he will get the same sentence. It's our corruption that says, well, the son won't get the same thing as what the lust will. Well, that's not true. And so there's this balance that we have between understanding him as father and the nearness and the embrace and the closeness that we have, but understanding him as king and that we should rightly tremble before him. We have to put those two in balance. I'm not going to say that's an easy thing to do, but it's what we need to do if we really want to walk in a place that's pleasing to him. And so God is pleased when we learn how to rightly fear him and love him. God is pleased through obedience. And obedience can only be one way. Obedience must be loving. If it's not loving, then it's not obedience. And so what does a parent want? So you got the little boy or the little girl, you know, they're seven, eight, or ten years old or something like that, and, and they're, they're playing some video game in the living room, and mom goes and says, son, take the trash out. And what does Junior do? He puts it on pause, goes into the kitchen, picks up the garbage, takes it out, puts it back in, and comes in. And mama just goes, man, what a good boy. Right? What a good boy. Because he obeyed. But usually what happens, he's playing the, the, the game, and mom has to say about ten times, and finally her voice reaches a particular pitch. The boy then knows mama's serious, and the boy obeys not because he's obeying, you see, he's not obeying out of love. The first expression is a child that obeys out of love. The second expression is a child that only does what he's told because now it's come to the point that he can be judged for his crimes. He's not obedient. He's a rebel. You understand? That's rebellion. It's just the person finally saying, well, I don't want to go so far to, to, to face his wrath, so now I'm almost there, so I'll do it now. He never wanted to do it in the first place. He didn't want to do it then. He's in rebellion in the heart, rebellion in the actions, and only feeling forced to have to do it. That's not obedience. Obedience is to obey the first time. And sometimes we're stubborn and have to hear, hear it the third or fourth time, but obedience will say, yes, I'm sorry, I disobeyed you, forgive me. And then you do everything in your power to obey. We please God through obedience. And so, just like the opening verse about we do this more and more in pleasing him, how do we please him more and more? We learn how to rightly fear him in a right way, and we learn how to obey him out of love. Our obedience becomes quicker and quicker because we love him. And so we're bringing joy to the heart of God when we just learn how to say yes and stop the fighting, stop the resisting, that we learn how to say yes quickly. So when he says stop that, we say yes, do this, yes. We may have to pray after that how to do it or the grace to do it, but that we become children then that long to obey him because like I touched on last night, his commandments are not burdensome to those who love him. And so Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus is our perfect example. And it says, And a voice from heaven said, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. 
Now, when you think of this, Jesus hadn't even done one miracle yet, and he hadn't even preached one sermon. And the Father's saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So you think of that there from, from birth until, well, I could even go, you could go back from conception. You know, this whole time where the son was in obedience to the Father, now it's time for the ministry to begin. To begin, and what does the father say? I'm well pleased with you. And he didn't say that for the sake of the son. The son knew where he was in, in the father. Perfect unity between father and son. But this was so others would hear. This was so John the Baptist could hear. This is so that John the Baptist could point out later, says, behold the Lamb of God. And some of his disciples begin to follow Jesus. But that's what it was. The father said, I am pleased with you, son. And our life should be striving to receive that same identical thing from him. I am pleased with you, son. I'm pleased with you, daughter. Jesus ended up giving the reason why this actually happened. Now, this is what's taking place after. After he started his ministry in John chapter 8, verse 29, Jesus said, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases him. For I always do what pleases him. And this means that Jesus had to, all along the life journey that he had, and all along his ministry, he had to constantly make that choice. I choose to obey. I choose to obey. He was tempted, we are told, in all ways like us, but was without sin. Because he made the choice through every temptation to obey his father to do what was pleasing to him, to bring joy to the heart of God. Everything, because when we give in to sin, we're not pleasing God, we're rebelling against him. We are bringing his displeasure. When we obey him and we resist temptation, he is finding joy in us. And like I said earlier, I find that absolutely astounding that I could bring joy to a God who is infinite, that he would care for me and be interested in me that he wants me to learn what obedience is. In John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and he will come to him and make our home with him. Now, this is the reality of what happens when a person is born again, okay? God is pleased when a lost person comes to the place, falls on their face before God, confesses their sins, saying, you are right, I am wrong, forgive me, I repent, I turn from my sins, I turn from the practice of, this, of my sins, I give myself to you. And what happens? If anyone loves him and will obey his teaching, the Father will love him, will manifest his love to him, and then they will come and dwell inside of him. They will do a work that is beyond anything we can imagine. We can't even fathom how it's done, but that his blood is able to purify these filthy temples so perfectly that he makes it a holy temple that he will dwell in. And what is that? That we're pleasing enough to him that he will make us a temple. That we please him enough, we bring enough joy to the heart of God that he says, I want to be within this one and speak to this life from inside rather than a voice from the outside that says, this is my son or this is my daughter in whom I'm well pleased. Shouldn't this become the passion of our life? I mean, if we claim to be Christian, shouldn't this become the passion of our life to hear those words, what Jesus heard, this is my son, this is my daughter, whom I, am, whom I love, with him I'm well pleased? Three times Jesus heard this. Three times this was spoken in, in, uh, at his baptism, at his uh, transfiguration and another time that, that the father spoke this. All three times was not for the sake of the son, but was for those who heard. But it was to give testimony to the reality that my son is doing everything to bring joy to my heart. He is pleasing to me. And all of Christianity is summed up with becoming like Jesus. That's what it is. So if we are to be like Jesus, we're going to be Christ-like, then it must become the goal of our life to be pleasing to him. God is pleased through a life of prayer. And the reason why I'm inserting this here is because you have absolutely no hope of pleasing God if you are not a person of prayer. People who are not in prayer, people who, not, who, don't, who do not live a life of prayer, cannot please God. 
because they do not know God's will. I'm serious about that. I believe that is so serious. Prayerless people are not Christians. They may go to church. They may claim to be Christian. They may be ministers and they may do good works. Does not mean that they know God. How can a person say they love God and not want to spend time with him? It's contrary to the whole idea of what this is about relationship with God. And so if we are to please him, we must be in that place of fellowship. We must, because we as humans are going to have struggles, and we're going to need to be in that place of communion with God to have grace to overcome those struggles, because we can't do it by our own wisdom. We can't do it through our own abilities. We must be in that place where we are tied into relationship with Christ and constantly going to him, crying for grace. Now, this is one of the things about Jesus we just can't understand but here he was always in perfect communion with the Father, yet he would go and leave. You'd have the height of ministry going on. These great things happen, and then he takes off into the mountains. Well, I think for two reasons. He went up into the mountains because he just loved being with his Father. But he also needed strength. He was truly human, though he was fully divine. He needed refreshing that was found at the feet of his Father. So he'd go, al go alone to be with his father. He loved being with his father. And you find it again and again. So Jesus goes and he heals the leper. And uh, then he, after he heals the, the, the leper, he hears, heals a man that's a paralytic. And what does he do? He goes up in the mountain. Gets away from him. Because what's happening now is his fame is beginning to explode. People are starting to pack the place to, to hear him and eventually be in the fields where there's multitudes out there. And he'd have to again and again do it. John chapter 6, here he is. He feeds the 5,000. I do not question in the least that during that time he was preaching and he was healing the sick. They wanted to make him king, so what does he do? He goes up in the mountain to be with the Father. You know, instead of what we would do so often, man, ministry is great. I need to get more and more in the limelight because, well, the world needs me. And uh, Jesus kept going up into the mountain to be with the Father. You see, how much more do we need that, that place of fellowship? And so in 1 John, I'll take you there again in 1 John chapter 3, verse 22. We receive from him anything we ask because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Isn't that interesting? So you have this obedience and this pleasing him together. And why does he answer the prayers of people? Because they obey him and do what pleases him. So that means a whole lot of people aren't getting their prayers answered, right? I mean, a whole lot of people aren't getting their prayers answered. So they're praying prayers that are worthless because God will not answer them because they're not in obedience and they're not doing what is pleasing him. He does not hear the, the prayers or responds in favor to the prayers of those who are unsaved unless they are prayers of repentance. There are times that he will respond in a particular way for their salvation. But if he answers the prayers of the unsaved, they'll stay in their unsaved condition. They will not see their need to. When people who call themselves Christians are not in right fellowship with him, if he answers their prayer, they will stay in their unsaved condition in the church, thinking that everything's okay because, well, I pray and God answers prayer. So God does not answer the prayer of those who are in disobedience so that they might come to repentance, so they might see the reality of their need. And that also means that they are left outside the help of God. God says, I will not help you. As long as you're in your sin, I will not help you. I will not help you in your life of sin. I'll not help you keep that life of sin. I will help you out of your sin, but not help you to stay in it. And so prayer is all about relationship with God, where we find a God who will be our helper in every situation. And that's why we need it so desperately. And you know, that's why the devil is so aggressive in trying to get prayer out of our lives. Because he knows when we are prayerless, that we are powerless, that we are totally vulnerable to the attacks of hell and will be drug away back into the world. He knows that. All you got to do is get people out of relationship with Jesus. God is pleased when we are like him. And so if I might say it like this, is the only person, and this comes from a, 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 an author, a, a very old, old author from hundreds of years ago, and uh, she ended up saying, nothing pleases the Father but Jesus Christ. 
and those that bear his mark of character. What an astounding statement. So if you want to please God, you've got to be like Jesus because the only one that pleases God is Jesus. So there's the goal. There's the prize. That's what we're to do. So the more like Jesus we are, the more we are pleasing him. So this whole Christian life is about Christ's likeness, about becoming more and more like him, about dealing with our pride to learn what is to walk in humility and dealing with all the other things in our life that more and more we, we represent God. And like we looked at last night, learning how to love more and more like him and finding victory over our selfish love so that everything in our life is moving to this place of Christ's likeness. And why do we want to be like Jesus? Because we want fellowship with him. That should be the reason, the motive behind it all. I want greater fellowship with you. I want to know you more so I can walk near to you. And as I walk near to you, I can share you better with others. The more I know you, the more I can tell others about who you are in a greater, more accurate way that's full of life and power. God, I need to be like you. And how often are you actually praying to be Christ-like? How often are you crying out to be like Jesus? You know, I think it needs to be something that we are constantly crying out, constantly, because this need of Christ's likeness is always there. And just like we looked at in the opening, we need to be maturing in this Christ's likeness. So the ultimate aim of the Christian life is Christ's likeness. Here's an interesting verse. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is that spirit. Now, there's some thought here that's very similar to the very first verse I read. Very similar, because it, it has this thing that you're growing, you're maturing, you're, you're going from greater glory in this place of greater Christ-likeness. But he says, we all with unveiled faces reflect the Lord's glory. Now, what is the idea of unveiled faces? What veils the face of God? Sin. Okay, when we sin, it's veiled. We cannot see him. We are blind and oblivious. We may try to think of what he is, but we really can't see him. And it tells us in Paul's arguments that the unsaved are veiled because they don't know Christ. They're veiled. Their understanding of this God is veiled. They can't comprehend who he is. They might even be a theolo theology teacher and still not comprehend who this God is, though they could teach facts about him. And so the veil is removed through repentance. The veil is removed. We begin to see him a little bit more clearly, but then we are to mature because if you think of that two-year-old child, like I referred to in the beginning, that two-year-old child understands the world from a two-year-old standpoint. That's all he can comprehend. He knows daddy goes to work, but he doesn't know what work is. He you knows daddy is getting, making money so that the family can live, but he doesn't understand money or the monetary system and how it works in this world. I mean, all these dynamics of the adult life that child cannot comprehend. He's understanding the world from a two-year-old standpoint. We are to mature, and as we mature, we begin to understand how God is working in our lives and in the lives of others in his church and in this world at large as we mature in our understanding of this God so that we can put this in greater application as we continue in this life. And so the veil is removed that we might begin to walk in this place of fellowship. And so we must seek to be transformed into his likeness. It will not happen just because you became a Christian. Yes, when you become an authentic Christian, there's this change that goes on where you come out of darkness into light. But to mature in the faith, you must make a choice. You must want that. You must seek after it. You must cry, God, I want to be a follower of you. I want to live this out. I want to be the real thing. And so we must seek to be like Jesus. Across this country, when I've prayed for people, and I do this, I've done this so many times, and I'll be up there and I'll say, what do you want? What are you up here for? And they'll say, well, I just, I need to know God's will in my life. And you know what I do? I always take them, always take them to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. If we will give our lives as a living sacrifice which is all about surrender. So if we will live surrendered to Christ, and that surrender is expressed in not conforming to this world, not being like this world, not doing what the world does, not acting like the world, and if we will allow him to transform our mind that we begin to think like Jesus instead of like the world, then we have a promise from God that we will know his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I could take this and make this very, very simple. 
The surrendered man is the only one that will know the will of God. The unsurrendered man will never know the will of God. Just that simple. You want to know God's will, learn how to live surrendered to him, and you will walk in that will. He will bring his will to pass in you. But when people refuse to obey him and live that life of, of obedience and submission to him, they will not know his will. What they do will only be the will of God, even if it is religious in nature, it will still just be their will because they're not in the place of surrender and wanting to walk that kind of life. And so to please God, we need to be like Jesus. And being like Jesus, we will be surrendered people that are knowing his will. And I'll tell you what, we need to know his will in these last days and how to live this out. We need to understand this. Final point. God is pleased when we have his heart. How can we be in a place that's right with Jesus and not love what he loves and not seek after what he is seeking after? If we're going to be pleasing to him, we have to come to the place where we start to know what he wants, what his desires are, what moves him, what brings joy to his heart, and begin to follow that. And he came for a reason. Luke 19, 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. You lay your head upon the bosom of Jesus like John did at the Last Supper, and you're going to hear the heartbeat of God. And the heartbeat of God is going to beat with a passion for the lost. I mentioned earlier that when we get to heaven, there's going to be no tears there. There'll be no sorrow. But yet, if there are tears right now in heaven, it's coming from Jesus, who is weeping, agonizing over a perishing world, and he is pleading with his church, if we would but hear, pleading with his church that they would have his heart for a perishing world. That we would get our eyes off of ourselves and off of our own wants and off our own ambitions and begin to fix them on Jesus and begin to understand what is of true, eternal value and make that the purpose of our life. And I guarantee you, when we begin to love souls more and more, he is pleased with that. He is pleased with that. And so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Paul said, On the contrary, we speak as men approved by God and entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please men, but God who tests our heart. So the thought here is, is our ambition should be to please God. We're not seeking to please man, but we're seeking to please God. And what does that mean? That God, by pleasing him, we become approved of him. We become people that have his approval, and when we have his appro approval, you know what he does? He gives us the gospel to give away. He entrusts us with the responsibility of giving it to people. That's a tremendous privilege, a tremendous responsibility. But it comes through Christ's likeness. It comes through becoming like Jesus in every aspect of our life so that we bring joy to the heart of God. <clears throat> And so you have the account where Jesus goes to the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, and he's waiting for this woman at the well. So as he's coming to the area of Samaria, and uh, they don't have any food, so he sends his uh, disciples into town, into a Samaritan town, to buy food. Now, the Jews normally never went through Samaritan towns. They would go miles out of the way to avoid the Samaritan territories. Because the Samaritans would abuse them. I mean, sometimes physically, usually at least verbally. And so, but anyway, he sends them in the town, and he's left all alone there. There's a divine appointment. He came there for a reason. Jesus was setting the stage up for revival. And it was going to come through one individual, not because that individual was, was so great or anything else. Actually, she was a, a, a wicked woman, lived a wicked life. And he meets that woman at that well. A woman that had five husbands. Now was just living with a man in fornication. <clears throat> Jesus goes to this woman and says in verse 34, well, excuse me, actually he said this to the disciples after he confronted the woman. And he said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And I, you know, the disciples, I can't just imagine, sometimes they were like sheep and, I mean, a, a deer in the headlights, you know. Just going, duh, I don't get it. You know, what are you saying here? You know, it's like oblivious 
absolutely oblivious to what's going on. So your food, I, we went into town to get your food, so did somebody feed you? What it went on? And he did not understand. They didn't understand that his purpose was to do the will of the Father. His life was about obeying the Father. And then he said in verse 35, do not say four months more than the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. You see, God wants to come to the place where our eyes are off of ourselves, off of our needs, off of our troubles, off of all the issues in our life where we're self-absorbed and consumed and can't even see Jesus, trying to get us out of that, deliver us from that life into a life where we begin to see him as the great God that we should bow down and, and adore, that he deserves our, our wholehearted, complete and absolute devotion, and it becomes the passion of our life to bring pleasure to him. And through that, you get this wonderful thing where Jesus begins to share his heart with us. He begins to share his heart. We know we should go out there and reach a perishing world, but you know he wants to bring it personal to us and begin to break our heart with what breaks his. He wants to make it personal to us where we begin to feel the pain and the reality and remember what it was to be lost in trespasses and sin. Remember the loneliness. Remember the hopelessness. Remember all the dynamics in your life before you became a Christian that you might remember what they are, that you might know that that's where they are right now and be a people moved, compelled to reach out to them so that your heart is aching. And even if in the midst of it, you become like Stephen preaching to a hostile group of people. And Jesus is standing there saying, Son, you're going to be with me in a couple moments. I am well pleased with you. I am well pleased with you. Father, we come before you now in the precious name of Jesus. It is your heart. It is your will for us to become pleasing to you. And Lord, you offer us everything we need for a life of godliness. You've kept nothing back. This life to please you is made available. But God has made available one way. Through the place of dependency upon you, submission to you, obedience to you. Through loving you more than anything else in this world. And Lord, I'm asking for a work in each of our lives. Each of our lives, God, this is where we are at. In one way or the other, those that are here that are true followers of Jesus need to understand the truth of this message. And those who are not right with him need to this evening get right. Because, Lord, when we stand before you, everything is going to depend upon whether or not we lived pleasing to you. Everything will depend upon it. Our eternity is contingent upon it. Whether we lived a life to bring joy to you or whether we lived a life of self-indulgence that was all about ourselves, all consumed with our hurts and pains or struggles and desires, everything will depend upon what we do with Jesus. And Lord, I'm asking for every true follower of Jesus here that something would rise up in them greater than they've ever known, a desire to know you more, a desire to mature a cry to become more like you, to be more like you tomorrow than what they are today and more like you a year from now than what they are right now, to have this constant cry of this transforming grace taking them more and more and more into a life of Christ's likeness that, that models who you are, that people might see the reality of Christ within us. And Lord, for anybody here that is not a true follower of Jesus, God, I'm asking that you would bring them to a place of surrender true surrender, God, that they would be weary of the life that they have lived and want to come to the place of true abandonment, true abandonment. God, would you bring any that are not right with you home this evening in the precious name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. In just a couple of moments, I'll open this altar up for those that are Christians and you want some prayer about this message, to live a life that's more pleasing to him and learn how to do it. And maybe there's something you specifically want prayer over. I'll do that in a moment. But I want to give a couple minutes for anybody here that's not right with Jesus.
You may have heard a hundred, a thousand messages. But if you're not right with Jesus, you're not right with Jesus. No sermon can change you. A sermon can lead you to the foot of the cross and tell you how to find the Savior, but the sermon, the message cannot find the Savior for you. We might be able to have faith that could see you healed. We might have faith that would believe that you would come to the place of the foot of the cross, but our faith cannot save you. That is between you and God and you and God alone. And so are you right with Jesus? Are you right now in a life that is pleasing to God? And if you're not living a life that's pleasing to God, then you are outside of that salvation. You are in some particular way in rebellion against God. And you are in rebellion against God because you have made the choice to be in rebellion against God. This has not happened by time and chance. This has been the purposeful act of your life. This has been what you have done, what you have lived, and what you are living. And are you yet weary of that life? Are you yet weary of it where you want to run home to Jesus, where you're just so tired of your sins, so tired of, of the person that you have been that you want Jesus to break into your heart, into your world, and change you? Now, I'm going to be very serious about this altar call here. If you are not a true follower of Jesus and you want to get right and you will do whatever, and I mean no more excuses, no, no blame shifting, but you want to do whatever it takes to get right with Jesus, then when I open this altar up, I want you right away to come to this altar. If you are not really willing to get the sin out of your life, if you're not really willing to say, God, revolutionize me from beginning and end, if you're not wanting to do whatever it takes, then don't come to this altar. Because if you come to this altar and you don't do what it takes in surrendering to Christ and getting the sin out of your life, you're only making yourself more guilty before God. But if you will come on his terms in true repentance, and you'll cut off the world. You'll cut off those things that you have delved into, that you've allowed in your life. And if you'll come to that place of surrender, true surrender to Jesus, he has promised that he will be to you a Savior. He will rescue you from yourself. If you are not a follower of Jesus, if you're a backslider and you want to come home, I want you right now to walk down this aisle and come forward. I want you to stand up and walk down this aisle and come forward. I'm only going to take a moment here. I'm not going to try and manipulate you to come down to this altar and get your life right with Jesus. If you want him, then lay aside the fear and the pride that is keeping you from him and come to him tonight. Now, church, I'm going to open this up for you. If you need prayer, God has spoke to you some way in this message and you want to deal with it, then I'll be glad to pray with you. Jesse and I will be glad to pray with you and just want to be a help in the way that we can as an evangelist to help with you in this process of trying to become pleasing to him. He wants you to do that. He wants you to be pleasing. That's the desire of his heart. So if this is something that you want, you need, then find a place up here at the altar and we'll come alongside of you in a moment and we'll come and pray for you. So this altar is open for any of you that need this and want it.
climb and a new place in me you will find whatever it takes to draw closer to you Lord that's what I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be more like you. That's what I'm willing. a voice calling me from an old rugged tree and it whispers draw closer to me leave this world far And a new place in me you will find whatever it takes to draw closer to you Lord that's what takes to be more like you Lord that's what I'm willing to do whatever it takes to be more That's what I'm willing to do. Whatever it takes to be more like you, Lord. That's what I'm willing. closer to you Lord that's what I'm willing to do whatever it takes for my will to break that's what I'm willing to do the greatest thing in all my life is loving you the great
to you, Lord. That's what I'm willing to do. Whatever it takes to draw closer to you, Lord. That's what I'm willing to you, Lord. That's what I'm willing to do. And whatever it takes to be more like you, Lord. That's what